Good evening, Trinidad and Tobago and the wider world. I am Kijan Haynes, and I am this week's guest host on AG Talks, uh, a show with a difference where the host of the show is actually the guest, or the one asking questions is actually the guest. So I guess I, as the guest, get to introduce the host, the Attorney General Faris al -Rawi. So thank you for having me host your show. Thank you so much, Kijan. That's, um, that's a good way to introduce us. Good, good night, good morning, depending upon what side of the world you're on, if you're listening in. Welcome to AG Talks. Um, purpose of the show is to try and transform what is a traditional political dynamic into an issues-based dynamic. What are you for? What are you against? What's the information necessary to get you to that point? Um, you, Kijan, have a particular talent in asking the hard questions in asking the strict points of view and in bringing forward what the voice of many people would like to come to the ears of people who occupy positions of power from time to time. So I wish to subject myself to the hard questions and to stir some of the issues up and to there get us go. into the dance. Well, flattery will get you halfway, halfway there. there. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, um, well, let me start with a question from the audience, actually. Sure. A lot of people are wondering, they seem to be seeing a lot of you. Is there an election coming up that we don't know about? It, it, people are saying, is Faris campaigning for something? AG Talks, the spaces, thing I, with Penny. I am, is there, is there I, a campaign I, that's happening that I'm we don't know very about? Very much so. I'm campaigning for New Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, I, that's a good answer. But. I genuinely, outside this door, mm -hmm. there's a wall with 16 pictures on it. 16 attorneys general of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And it's very rare that you get the opportunity to occupy an office like that. And whilst you have the chance to hold on to that steering wheel and to drive the country part of the distance, you have an obligation to get somewhere. So I'm very passionate about the opportunity that we have to effect some change and therefore recognizing that there's a lot of noise and distraction mm -hmm. in how other people carry your story. I'm here to try and tell my own story for my own government and my own people. Okay. So this is not a, a, a push for, uh, this is my last time I'll ask this, a leadership of any party, mainly yours. I, I'm, I'm just interested in the job that I have to do right now. My job given to me by the Prime Minister is to transform Trinidad and Tobago in the legislative structure and in the litigation structure. So that's my job. All right. So we have a lot of stuff to, to discuss. Uh, we, want, we are talking the death penalty. Uh, this is a broad topic. It is a very... Uh, it, it gets a lot of people going when we when we discuss it. And I think one of the biggest issues we have is that people don't understand that it's actually still on our books. We have a situation where whenever there's a particularly heinous murder, people yell, bring back the hangman. And everybody has to say, but it never left. But there is this one issue of Pratt and Morgan, which I, re I realized in prepping for this, that a lot of people don't actually understand what Pratt and Morgan is or understand why people are not being hanged from Woodford Square once a week. Um, I will give it the very short definition of Pratt and Morgan is if you have not exhausted all of your appeals in five years, then it's considered particularly heinous and your sentence is commuted to life that's exactly it so yes the offenses against the penalties uh, against the prisons act is a law 1925 section 4 of that law says if you are convicted for murder you die by hanging our constitution sets up the supreme law section 2 the constitution sets out certain rights in sections 4 and 5 and the right against cruel and unusual punishment is effectively recognized in your human rights in sections four and five. However, our constitution in 1962 and then 1976 set up a particular clause, it's in section six of the constitution, that has something called the saved law. And what it says is, look, any law prior to 1976 that was on the books, right. that law is still good to go. So section four of the Offenses Against the Persons Act says that if you are convicted of murder, that you should hang. So the issue with that is we have all of these, and that's why we probably still have all of these colonial laws that you know, are quite outdated and should be um, amended at the very least, if not 
totally in some down. cases some of them are very useful like the exchequer and audit arrangements mm -hmm. um, the board of inland revenue act there, there are some aspects that are still particularly good um, but yeah we, we we need to hold on to certain aspects people say where's the hangman or bring back the hangman as you said so the hangman is in a position where he can do nothing and effectively the hangman is doing nothing there are 1,100 odd people on death row, um, sorry, on trial waiting for their murder charges to come up. Let me give you that precise number here. So this is the amount of people in remand mm -hmm. so waiting let, let's deal with this. for... Let's deal with where's the hangman and let's do it the way I like to do it, which is with statistics. We have 1,260 people inside the jails of Trinidad and Tobago awaiting a trial on a charge of murder. We have 45 people who have been sentenced to death and are in custody. We have in that structure a position to decide, well, how are we going to have this law applied? Because it's still on the books. Mm -hmm. People have been asking, what's the government's position? The government's position is that we support the death penalty. That's the government's position. People are saying, well, what's the point of having the death penalty if you can't carry it out? You introduce Pratt and Morgan. Effectively, the Jamaican case that went to the Privy Council said, listen, it's cruel right. to have somebody waiting for a sentence of death for more than five years, so get them life imprisonment. Now, back in the day, when the last hanging happened in Trinidad and Tobago, statistically... Don't shady back in 1999 correct, for anybody who... The, the Privy Council used to there. finish its judgments within nine months. It is a matter of record that the United Kingdom abolished the death penalty. And if you look to the words coming out of the Privy Council, and it's a very important case called Matthews. That Matthews case is a critical case for anybody. It's, it's a judgment of the Privy Council. It is the case of Charles Matthews versus the state. And when you read the dissenting judgment, where nine judges of the Privy Council stood up and said, well, yes, Trinidad and Tobago's constitution still allows you to hang. As much as we don't like it, it's still the law. That position is that now we can't finish matters within five years for a number of reasons. So have they been deliberately uh, delaying? I want to be fair piece? as an attorney general to say that the Privy Council never delays. Mm -hmm. A lot of the problems was in the criminal justice system in Trinidad moving fast enough to get matters there. Right, that is an issue as the well. The Privy Council does its part diligently every time, but after the Privy Council, you still have the international court that you can approach. And if your matters spill over five years, whilst you're at the Privy Council or the international arena, it's that's it, you go there. Commuted. So what the government is on about right now, what we did from 2015 to 2021, was to radically transform the system of justice. Because part of the reason why you can't hang somebody is that the system was not just working. Now, the system... <laughs> Is, a, is an interesting concept, right? What is the system? The system is the judge, the prosecutor, the witness, the accused, the place where you have the justice, the rules that you have the justice in. There are a number of factors inside of the system that we paid attention to. We doubled the judiciary, we added more courts, we put in rules, etc. What we have before us right now that I'd like to lay on the table by way of a mm -hmm. statistical output we introduced something called the Public Defenders Division. And these are people who, if you can't afford an attorney, you know that old line, if you can't afford an attorney, one would be provided for you. Right. The, we are providing. Now, here's the critical point on this. Having doubled the number of judges in law from 36 to 64, having raised the age of retirement for judges from 65 to 70, having created a criminal division for the first time where you just have criminal courts, about to open the Tower D courts as we get into construction, mm -hmm. restarting tomorrow, etc. The key point was, well, do you have a lawyer available for these people? So I told you a little while ago that we have 1,260 people in remand, right, awaiting trial. Right. I want you to know that 728 of those people are in the public defender's department's hands. So we created as a government a public defender's division and more than half of the people who are awaiting trial for murder are now in the hands of the public defenders. Now, are these public defenders uh, 
encouraged to speed up trials, whereas an attorney might delay and delay and delay, get more money, which is an issue that's been in having. Uh, are these public defenders now encouraged to push so a trial? So I want to say that the public defenders division, which falls under the legal aid authority, is managed by a very um, aggressive team of attorneys. They're all salaried, but they are top-notch attorneys. And they've been going into the prisons, getting instructions, and when they go into the prisons, they're being met with by they're being met in the prisons environment with people saying, Listen, we are dying to have a trial. Right. We want to have our day in court. And I wanna tell you that nearly two hundred of these seven hundred odd people are ready to plead guilty to murder felony. But let's put a pin in that. Public defenders are not known for being the best of the best, right? This is basically you get what you pay for. It's free. What is is there a fear that these people are now just saying, "Look, you're not the best lawyer. I, you will just do whatever you have to do, get it over with, and then move on to the so next." Here's how we treat. So you, you start to just churn here, people. Here's out how we treated with that. A vast number of the lawyers actually went from the DPP's office to the public defenders division, and the public defenders division have the ability to outsource lead counsel to lead their pack. What we did was to make sure that in the event that you do not have a lawyer to start your case, that one will be provided for you and a very competent lawyer at that. So the Public Defenders Division have had recent victories in the public domain in judge-only trials. Remember, the courts in 2021 are not what we had in 2015. Right, so we you have, don't need to find a jury and all of we that. We have so virtual courts. We have appearances from the prison. You're on a laptop. You are now in an environment where there are rules, where things are set. We have taken the caseload down from 146,000 cases in the magistrate's court. We chop off 104,000 motor vehicle and road traffic. Marijuana, 8,500. So what I'm saying now, in this environment, the need for a lawyer has to be met. And the public defender, just to answer your question, mm -hmm. the public defender is a very competent attorney provided for you by the state. And very importantly, the opportunity for delay is removed in these in these opportunities. And then, but that is but that is the issue that I'm raising. Then you end up in a situation where somebody uh, you've seen the issue of people's taking plea plea deals just for the sake of well, I'll give you this if you give me that, and and, and you know you still end up maybe not fighting the best case so you let's can take possibly a pin. fight. Let's deal with what we are dealing with in Trinidad and Tobago. We have a situation where we have 1,260 people inside of the prison waiting for trial for murder. The data before I became Attorney General was that if you took every judge to deal with the number of cases, you would take 10 years to deal with the cases that are awaiting trial. What we did was to double the numbers, provide more courts, etc. But the point inside of here now, you're spending $260,000 per prisoner per year Mm -hmm. to keep them inside of jail. And many of them have been waiting 10 years, 20 years in certain instances. Forget murder for a moment. There are prisoners who were awaiting trial and have been in jail longer, longer than the sentence, than the sentence that they would they get. We've heard and, that. and therefore, those people required defense attorneys. Now, people will say, because I'm hearing it, that you are churning out, if, you're churning out statistics, right? Yeah. So you're saying... You're doing dollars and cents, what makes the most sense. But at the end of the day, these are still people. These are people who still want the best possible um, case. These are people who probably don't even want to spend any more time in prison. They want to be cleared of the any, 728 any charge. people this, are not forced to take the public defender, you know. Right. They welcome the public defender and say, hallelujah, somebody, they have somebody, somebody they have has to come them. to protect my human rights. So I'm not on about dollars and cents is one perspective of what I offer. What are we organizing? What I'm saying to you here now, if half of the people who are on uh, murder charge have accepted the public defenders because they chose to accept the public defender because they want their day in court. And part of what we are now discussing tonight, I'd like to discuss, mm -hmm. uh, the discussion that I'd like to bring to the table right now is the whole concept of the categorization of murder. Because How why would I treat with murder? Because why would I ever plead guilty to, to murder if I know the penalty is the death penalty? Well, I want to flag this. The Privy Council in September 2021 is going to hear a case called Chandler. Nine judges in the Privy Council are going to sit on the matter of whether 
the mandatory death penalty in Trinidad and Tobago is constitutional. And this what chandler what, has, has far-reaching impl yeah, um, implications mean? for more than just that. Let me explain this for a moment. Yeah. So the mandatory death penalty is anybody convicted of murder must hang. The case has been built in many countries, and particularly if you look at the, the Nervous judgment that comes out of the uh, Caribbean Court of Justice. They say, look, you can't treat all with one particular fit. So, for instance, somebody did commit murder because somebody died by their hand, but it may have been an act of euthanasia. Somebody was suffering. It right. may have been a father who killed somebody who raped his daughter or killed his child. Is there a circumstance where death is always to be mandatory? That's going to be on test in the Privy Council. This government and this ministry has been paying attention to the system of justice. And one of the things that we're paying attention to and that we're inviting stakeholder comment on is the concept of the categorization of murder. We did not agree as a party, the PNM, to the categorization of murder because there was a risk that you would have abolished the death penalty. I told you that we support the death penalty. The risk was that you would abolish the death So back in 2011, before the Privy Council and the Caribbean Court of Justice had an opportunity to look at the mandatory death penalty, we did not support a categorization of murder because there was a risk that you'd never be able to use the hangman again. It's now a topic for discussion because that law has been settled. What happened in the other countries like Barbados is that they allowed you to keep the death penalty on a discretionary basis where you use the death penalty for the most heinous crimes. Well, let's put that, let's put that uh, to the first question that we have from Christine who asked, can someone commit a murder so gruesome that it surpasses any legal process and take it to the Privy Council to rule or influence the Privy Council decision? So in other words, do not pass go, go straight to death penalty. I can tell you this, that there are people that have um, committed terrible acts of murder. Mm -hmm. There's actually a very interesting case that comes out of one of the Caribbean islands where the person beheaded an elderly man, gutted his belly open, splayed him out, did all sorts of horrible things, and the judgment coming from the Privy Council on the discretionary aspect of the death penalty was that that was not gruesome enough to deserve the death penalty. But so, who, by whose standards? But well, this is the this is the Privy Council's decision. Right. But they don't. But they are, are typically not yes. pro so, death so, penalty. So, so, so they answer, will say that. So to answer the question that came, well, right. yes, somebody can commit a terrible act. The problem with having another jurisdiction's point of view, the English point of view, where there's an abolitionist sort of point of view, where they don't support the death penalty, is that you're going to have to hold on. Now, what I can say of the Privy Council is that. I've seen them uphold things that they don't even believe in from a societal point of view. So in the Matthews case, the Privy Council was very clear, the majority judgment in Matthews, mm -hmm. to say, listen, we will uphold the mandatory death, death penalty in Trinidad and Tobago constitutionally because it saved law, even though there was a very strong dissenting judgment that said, look, that's wrong. You should not do that. So the only way to do that is if someone raises a constitutional mo a motion that gets to the pr Privy Council, which well, gives them now. the ability to... It's in the Chandler case. It's due for trial this year, 2021, at the Privy Council, where nine judges of the Privy Council are going to sit together. And what they're effectively going to do is they're going to relook at Matthews. Matthews is the case that says you could still keep the mandatory death penalty. So what you're saying is there is a possibility that sometime later this year, Trinidad and Tobago may not have the death penalty on its books, depending on it how it is. It may not have a mandatory, mandatory death, death penalty. penalty. It may have a discretionary death penalty where the judge will decide if the case is so terrible that death should be the option available in the case so that society should rid itself of this situation. But Kijan, I, I really want to say that it's important for us to put this into context. Right. So good. now that if you don't have mandatory, that's when the categorization, I'm guessing, comes in because yes. you will have yes. so that's not why, this extreme heinous. That's why tonight I, I'm, I'm inviting the perspective as follows. Fact one, 1,260 people are awaiting trial. Fact two, 780-something people are at the public defender's division. Fact three, some 200 people are ready to plead guilty to murder felony. Fact f murder felony being other than just going mm -hmm. along with a, a murder issue. Fact four, it costs us $260,000 a year to keep a prisoner in remand. Fact five, 
the prison system is now subject to a brand new criminal justice system where we have judge-only trials, where we have matters that are actually moving. So I want to lay on the table to Trinidad and Tobago that we're not just talking about the law, we're talking about the operationalization of the law. Let me put something to you. To the average citizen listening to this, who is more afraid of the bandit coming and robbing them down the road, they might say, well, what would that have to do with me? What would you say to, to those people? This is what I call monster management. We're talking about murder, and it's a fact that murders are committed by children even, which is why we have a children's court. Right, anybody can commit a murder, but does, does this, now we've, we've had this, this discussion, every sixth former writes this in, in their GP or whatever they call it, now yeah. essay. Does the death penalty actually create a deterrent well, for... What we can say now... For crime. What we can say now is that we will have the ability to test that. Let me ask you this. Does the death penalty stand as a deterrent for people with drugs passing through Singapore? The answer is yes. People are mortified in passing through Saudi Arabia or Singapore that the death penalty may be applied. Is that, I mean, is that anecdotal? Is, uh, that, how, how, we, that, how do, that, we, that's, how do that's, we put that? How do you prove that? that? That's proven by the data that exists in it. Now, this is a very heartfelt pros and cons issue, mm -hmm. right? So there will be very heartfelt views that say that the death penalty is of no use. It costs us more money and um, time and, and it is uh, lacking in dignity and in human rights. And there's another point of view that says, look, there are certain aspects where society should treat with it. Mm -hmm. The best data that I guess you could look at is in the United States. What I can tell you from my perspective, is that law can change society. And let me give you the example. Changing, Traffic tickets. Exactly. Speeding tickets. Changing that resulted in a 65-year low in road deaths, right? So where do we... No, I'll, 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 this is uh, Rashid from Instagram has this question. Uh, will religious bodies be consulted on the death penalty? And I will add to Rashid's question. We have a lot of strong human rights activists in this country who may not want a death penalty at all. So they will still fight that. How do you balance people who may, again, it's easy to say that anecdotally that it's, it's, it's a deterrent, but it's hard to, to really say that anybody who is committing a crime down there, oh, I'm hungry, so I just go in and... They're not thinking about that. So who, how do we reach out to the human rights activists who may have a different um, point of view, the religious bodies who may still be completely against the death penalty? What is your plan to reach out to them to get their So, so why, why am I talking death penalty? I'm talking death penalty because, number one, it's part of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. Number two, it has not been operationalized since the late 90s. Number three, the question is, can it change society? Is it a deterrent or not? Number four, there's been a radical change in the criminal justice system and therefore we have a chance to test this out. The reason why we hold on to the death penalty as one of the conversations here is that we believe that it is something that ought to be kept at this point in time. Why? If you're going to keep it, let's at least see if it's going to go to work or not go to work. Are we going to consult uh, the religious bodies and views? We take on board all of the views. We are not a theocracy, we're a democracy, and we will certainly welcome all of the views. But the policy of the government is to maintain the death penalty. My position right now as the Attorney General is to operationalize it. Right. We have a, we have a situation where we don't have a referendum system. I remember in the last administration, they would say, well, we'll put the CCJ to a referendum. And I think it was your response was, well, that's not part of our constitution. Is it time that we put something like that to the people where we have people vote not just for party, but we have people vote for issues? And I, I feel like this is a good one to start. Well, well, look at it this way. One of the main factors why we're having the AG Talk series is to specifically get to issues as opposed to the way you look, the way you sound. Boy, I don't like Faris, so I like this one. <laughs> well, so we're talking about issues. So to answer your question, the best form of referendum could only happen when you actually have something that is working. What was your data? Was the output? Is it a deterrent? Is it not? There has to be a, a seizing of information. So you, so you wouldn't want to put a referendum to the country to have them vote, go to the polls just like everything else and say, do you want the death penalty? And then maybe work backwards from there. Well, I'll tell you, 
my on the individual issue no because i don't think that a referendum law works well in the best interest of society right so a referendum law can be had you do a bill which is a referendum mm -hmm. bill and you could go on to issues but look at how that worked out in brexit, brexit right look at how that worked out in certain other places we do have a referendum every five years and yeah in, but, that, but that, like i was saying that, that vote is not that vote is not is hardly ever on issues that vote is on so if you say party, that it's hardly ever on issues but, would you even put that concept of referendum now if you know that in trinidad and tobago the concept it, right now is not what is the truth but what's your version of the truth are you going to trust it to a referendum but then what is the version of the truth that you're using to keep the death penalty? Right. So my, I mean, I can ask that on anything. So my, my starting point on the death penalty is I want to put it to work. And let me see what I get from it. Are people um, believing that it's a deterrent? Does it actually work? Are murders going to go down? Well, we had to test that by seeing if the hangman can go to work. So you, I are, have so you are intent system. on bringing back I have a system to make it work. And what is the system? Clear the backlog sending lawyers that they're willing to accept where half of the people on remand right now are willing to have lawyers from the public defender work get them judge only trials weed out the matters that don't need to go to the hangman if they are pleased etc and then the cases that can go to the hangman if we're able to remove the structures of delay around them now we can have a proper discussion on whether the hangman works or not now you're using the term hangman there's a question from uh, Jose B, forgive me if I mispronounce that, why hanging? Can we use lethal injection or is hanging just a uh, turn of phrase? Is that the only way that we have because on our statute? Because it's saved law. And not to the Yes, internet. because it's saved law and the law is that you hang, it's the hangman. So there's no... In the, US, in the US, I know they have lethal injection. I think in some severe cases, you even have um, firing squad. You can choose. The, the, the so problem, you don't have an option. No, the, the problem with that is that even though Section 6 of the Constitution allows you to um, treat with a saved law in a slightly different way, provided it stays within what was there before, even though you have that, the attack against the um, death penalty in whatever form it is will open up a door to say, well, uh -huh, you repealed the law and you changed it and therefore you threw away the option to kill people at all for the offense of hanging in a judicial sense, right? For, for the offense of murder, forgive me, in a judicial sense. So. We're on to hanging, we're staying with hanging. The mission right now is to put the hangman to work. The methodology to get there involves what we've done for the last five years. We're having this discussion now because the timing is right. The timing is right because we have a criminal division. We have double the judges. We have 129 new courts. It sounds like you're saying, let me experiment. You're literally experimenting with people's lives here. No. These are people who are who uh, you're saying, well, let me see if I hang 10 people, that means that, let's see if crime goes down. So, like, so, you, so let's, it's, start, it's, let's start with this. This is the law of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. 1925, the Offenses Against the Persons Act crystallized what was always the law before that under the English colony, and hanging has been a feature which has been applied here and elsewhere in other countries, right? The death penalty is a established system of many laws. My obligation as the attorney general facing this question all the time of where is the hangman or bring back the hangman is to operationalize it provided that that's the government policy the government policy is to operationalize it why not move forward why there, there are so many more countries that don't use the death penalty that do and then these, the, uh, the countries that do use the death penalty aren't looked upon in the greatest light you have uh, the philippines saudi arabia as you say what Singapore. about the United States of America? The, only mother, a few, the mother of democracy in who, some people's well, eyes. Well, in some people's eyes, but only a few states. They, yeah. they, the majority of states do not allow for the death penalty. Yeah, th th so, that argument just fell on the United States of America. Trinidad and Tobago is at an interesting crossroads. We are like other countries where we have a polarity of views. Right. We are not in a place where we discuss issues necessarily. And that's what I was right? saying, if we vote on it. This is now an attempt. You asked me a little bit earlier, why are people seeing me so often? You see me on issues. You're not seeing me on fluff or talk. We're talking I mean, revenge porn. We're talking criminalizing the abuse of, of women. We're talking about trafficking in persons. We're talking about murder. We're talking serious issues. Because the society needs to hear serious issues. Why are we doing this thing in this format? 
because we want to reach younger minds to open their points of view. Fair. No. Uh, let's, let's, let's get into the question that uh, everybody is going to ask. Adjusting the, the, the death penalty in any way is going to be a constitutional matter. Uh, getting categories of murder constitutional, you're going to need opposition so support. I'm not, this I'm is not proposing to amend the constitution. I'm, I'm proposing. Does, so it does not const so, so I'm looking, I'm looking at the constitutional issues. What I can say is that I'm not worried about the constitutional issues. Whatever requires a constitutional majority is what will be required. So there is no way that this thing can be carved up without a constitutional majority if you require one. So if there is, if you are saying now that in a category of murder, a lesser, a lesser murder charge does not warrant the death penalty, does that not affect the constitution where yes, murder there, there, there will be a is... There will be a constitutional right. consideration. And here is where the issue, once it's presented, is now going to be for the government and the opposition and the independent bench to decide what do they stand on and what are their positions uh, in relation to that. And then how do you plan to get around whatever opposition support or lack of support is going to happen over this? I predict a joint select committee is going to... to to be called, and this is going to be kicked down the the can the kick the can down the road for the next few years as many things do. This is a serious issue that could so be I'm, very well. I'm, I'm not afraid of joint select committees. We've had select committees and joint select committees very successfully go to work. Look at the cannabis authority. It is now on the parliament floor completed. The local government joint select committee is completed. The Tobago joint select committee was completed is actually on the floor of the parliament. We did the sex offenders registry in a special select committee. We did plea bargaining in a special select committee. So I'm not afraid of that. The question is, can you drive the process? I'd like to have the views, because you asked me a little while right. ago, will you take in the views of the churches and, and ecclesiastic bodies? And the human people, rights organizations. Human rights? Yes, we, we want those views to ultimately come up with the best point of law. But there will always be a point where the work of the committee comes to an end. And at that point, it comes down in the House to 41 people and in the Senate to the senators, in, including the independent senators. And it will still, at some point, and require a special majority. Yes, and it's at that point where you're going to know what you stand for or against. So I am against child marriage. I took a law to abolish child marriage. The opposition did not support it. So I'm against... At first. Well, correct. So my point is, once the issue became plain and you had to make a decision, that's how you prompt a result. Yeah. To be fair, they did, they did end up su supporting and their, their, re their response was always, we support, but, and they wanted some, they some were, they changes were, they were made. So they, did, they so were, they did eventually support. They were cornered support. into supporting because they were on the wrong side of the issue. Yeah. But I just want to just clear that, yeah. clear that out. So they, they did come out and say, yes, we support but there was a but. So let's um, look at what's going to happen in a, in a world where we now have categories of murder. As quickly as possible, can you say how you will categorize So the murder? reason why I want to have this discussion on it, mm -hmm. apart from observing what happened in other countries, what the courts are likely to do or not, I'd like to approach the cabinet. So this is a public consultation. I'd like to approach the cabinet to get its policy in relation to this law. So the cabinet is So is the cabinet not, the cabinet has, has not decided on has this yet. not has not had this. What I do in the process of legislative making is we take um, consultation on issues, crystallize that and then have a have a position to take to the cabinet. Okay, so how so how far away or how close I, are we to I reaching have a, I have any a of notes this? prepared. I have the structures done. I'd like to seek the guidance of the cabinet and its approval in relation to this. For instance, the cabinet might very well say, well, let's wait on the Privy Council decision. Right. Let's be cautious in relation and to this the is, point. Is due when again? Um, the case will be heard in September, September 2021. Right. That's the Chandler case. But I have an obligation to be upfront prepared and to have the discussions so that at least I can say, well, look, in X sector, this was their point of view. In Y sector, this is their point of view. Here's what the general understanding, much like we did on cannabis. Right. All right, so I'm getting another Pratt & Morgan question, but this is how we started it. So again, Pratt & Morgan, if anyone just tuning in, is the Privy, Privy Council judgment that says that if you have not exhausted 
all of your appeals straight up to the Privy Council and the international um, bodies, yeah, courts. In five years, if you have not done that in five years, then that means that your sentence, your automatic death sentence, is now commuted to life in prison. Perfectly correct. Right. Yes. Um, so let's get into this. If I, in a perfect world, this this happens, does who does who who does you wait now fall on to charge somebody based on this categorization of murder? Right. So the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions is consulted in relation to these matters. So you'll very often hear that the DPP has advised the police to charge. So the police do the charging. The advice comes from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And we've been very careful to respect the boundaries, right? So I don't conduct the criminal aspects of law. So the DPP is the person who now decides category one murder, charge category two, and all of that. That's correct. In, if you think back to Derek Chauvin, the person now convicted of killing George Floyd, he was charged with three different types of murder mm-hmm. and all stuck. Mm-hmm. This, is this something that we're looking at? Here? So I could be basically be charged with murder three times. Potentially. So there are permutations and combinations that can happen in relation to this, which is why having the consultation in the, in the public zone is so important. Let's hear what the Law Association has to say. Let's see what the aspects look like. So this consultative aspect may very well result in potentials like that, where you have a combination of events going on. The, you see, the key is to remember that the timing for this discussion could not have happened prior. Right. Let me, let me ask you something. If there is a situation where this passes and I committed a murder that... No. Many years ago, I committed a murder that now has a lesser sentence. Mm-hmm. Do I now ask for a retrial? Uh, this might, is, is it retroactive? So well, if I've already served 20, what, 20 years, what's really interesting, do I leave? Do I we have Section up? 87 of the Constitution. What is 87 of the Constitution? We have the presidential pardon aspect, right? So one of the very important factors is that even though somebody may have been treated with in a particular way in the past, when society begins to change its point of view, as a legislative expression, for instance, right? We change the law. You have an option now to knock on the door of the president at the mercy committee and say, listen, can you consider this in light of this? But this happens only, uh, I think it's independence, I believe is when the president nope. does the part. No, they nope. can, or the president nope. can pardon. You can knock on the door, Anytime. Any single day, and in fact, we've put in some, some significant reforms into the Mercy Committee. The Mercy Committee advises Her Excellency at present, the, the, the President. The Mercy Committee advises the President on the exercise of the power of pardon. And that could be from a clean wipe the slate to changing aspects of your sentence. And that is the DPP, the Attorney General, the Minister of National Security, and certain other people who are appointed by the President. And they consider these matters. We're very importantly introducing the parole law. So we have a parole bill to introduce inside of the prisons aspect. One of the really important things is, well, okay, you've got people in jail. What are you doing with them? The The restorative restorative side of it. Is is there psychiatric assistance? Is this person beyond help, etc.? And that's why uh, Celine from Twitter is asking, is it possible to have a separate prison uh, for someone who is spending life in prison versus just awaiting trial, but that is the difference between remand and yes. MSP, uh, yes. maximum security prison and, and, and that. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a question from Niger who's asking, and this is a question of, um, before we even get to sentencing, uh, can we ask for a retrial if there's better forensics that might change the evidence? Absolutely. Okay, so it comes down to, before we even could talk about sentencing and all that, we have to get a conviction. And that has been a problem yes. with, our, with our courts. Problem because of no judge, no rules of court, no defense attorney, no witnesses present. We've amended all of that. And on fresh evidence, yes, as you bring in the forensic um, tools and analysis, fresh evidence can come up in certain circumstances where you can ask for uh, a court to look at your, at your sentence in light of fresh evidence. Now, when it comes to... Uh, trying these cases. If I am going for murder one versus murder two, do I also have the option of trial by judge versus trial by jury? Does, will all of that still Abs- apply? Absolutely. So 
when we passed the judge only law, mm -hmm. there's no right to a jury. Let's start with that. There's a philosophy that you can have a jury and it's good. In, in so it's not that you have a right to be tried correct. by a jury of your peers? Correct. No, because look at it. You can go to the magistrate's court and be convicted of some very serious offenses, long jail terms, millions and millions of dollars by one magistrate. You can have a right of appeal, etc. And the magistrates deal with criminal matters. When we passed the judge only law, where you could choose to have a judge only, I was met with the opposition telling me nobody will ever use the judge only route for murder. We have had several judge only murder trials with convictions which were not appealed and with acquittals. And Justice Lisa Ransomer Hines. Um, Justice Lucky, before she was elevated. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at and these things, we have actually proved that people will use judge only for murder matters. Let me tell you where it's most important. You see child offenders. When you're taking somebody who committed murder as a child and 15 years later they come into trial as a hardback man or woman, a judge will faster see the child in the man or woman than a jury will. And therefore, there are very important areas where judge-only trials are very, very useful. But more than that, juries, you don't have to worry about picking. And picking a jury is or a, a tampering or fear or, or intimidation. To, exactly. Yes. So there's that hope that yes. that will, will speed up the process. But mind you, the same way you asked me a little while earlier, are you testing this out? Right. Are you experimenting? Let me tell you this. The judge-only experience is proof that you ought to really test the systems. So introducing judge-only trials has proved to be extremely useful to Trinidad and Tobago and other conversations have to happen on that. So, so let's do a quick recap for anyone just joining us. So in September 2021, the Privy Council is ruling on a major... We'll hear. We'll, we'll hear, hear case, sorry. Yeah. We'll hear a major issue, uh, a major case, which could possibly strike down the death penalty as our could strike down the mandatory, mandatory death, death penalty, penalty as, as mandatory. opposed to the discretionary death penalty. Exactly. And what does discretionary death penalty mean? Leave it to the judge to, to decide, decide in certain circumstances that the death penalty is appropriate as opposed to it being automatic for every type of murder. Right. However, the government's position or at least the cabinet's position is still that the death penalty is on the law books of Trinidad and Tobago and you would still like to see it being so, enacted. So the government's position is to operationalize the death penalty, the obligation. So we stand on maintaining the death penalty. The issue before us is a different issue. It is whether we should consider a discretionary death penalty as opposed to mandatory. Right. And this goes on to the topic of categorization of murder yes. thereby one murder may not be as uh may not face the death penalty it might face a minimum sentence or a maximum sentence yes as the as the case may be what now how do you have at least in your mind what those separations would be at yeah. least a vague so, idea. so 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 the very heinous murders where you uh murder with rape or aggravation or you've killed law enforcement premeditated, way, premeditated. premeditated calculated i went to kill a prison officer right. i went to kill a policeman i calculated to kill this person who's having an affair with my husband or wife etc right that premeditated structure is usually what most countries consider to be murder one okay and then you get down into the other forms of categorization so i will use an example of that the opposition has used in uh, other cases where if someone killed my daughter and I, in an act of revenge, went out and did that, is that the same as premeditation? Or do I say, oh, well, he was just temporary insanity? So is, there's the defense. That, that, that so goes so to, there's, there, there are lots of defenses that would take you out of murder right. and take you perhaps into manslaughter, etc. Those things would still exist, right? But this is really to make sure that those 1,260 people that we have in Trinidad and Tobago are they all in the actual basket where they all absolutely have to hang? That's the question. And that's what this test, this test is about. Remember, this issue is tied on to a few other issues. Huh? You see the functionality of the criminal justice system? So we've dealt with the public defender, the judges, the rules of court, 
evidence now being recorded visu uh, visually, mm -hmm. etc. We have the prosecutorial side, the TTPS, the DPP. Those are very strong limbs. In and these the are people who also need to up their game. Yes. Because it's very easy. Can, and, and do you foresee a situation where if I get charged for murder two instead of murder one, uh, my case could just be thrown out? It's, well, you should have charged them with this and that because well, so many cases have been thrown out because of you, the you, wrong charge. You can, you can have, well, in, in the case of murder, there's a very important concept that we're also discussing. It's the year on a rule, the year and a day rule. You commit murder if somebody dies within a year and a day of an event that you caused in certain circumstances. Okay. So if they died in certain circumstances a year and two days after, it may not fall within the category, right? So there's a causation. If there's a break in the causation, um, you go down. So there is another topic that we have in discussion. It's the year and a day rule. And we're looking at that very sincerely right now. And part of this discussion also involves another piece of work that we're treating with, witness anonymity. It's a big thing. You can't that have already... a trial if you don't have witness evidence. And this is the, uh, the video yes, recording. Yes, and, uh, and there are uh, certain protection measures for vulnerable witnesses that we have taken to the parliament and the opposition rejected, and which we want to come back to the parliament again on. And this is in lieu of witness protection, which most people don't avoid. want to sign on to, right. correct. Yes. It, 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 it's a corollary to it. So the DPP's office, the TTPS, the witnesses. These are some things that are outside the control. Because remember, witness intimidation or witness murder is a real factor in, 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 a, in the equation. A, you, you always see that headline. Uh, and of course, the inevitable question from Zion Benjamin, would it just be easier if we had the CCJ to be our final court of appeal well, the CC, rather than... The CCJ has struck down the mandatory death penalty. So Already. So Even if case, you went to them, there was so no... So in the no. case of Barbados, the reason that we have not gone to the CCJ is in three simple letters. UNC. Let me explain what I mean by that. It's not I, a political thing. To get to the CCJ, you have to have the constitutional, constitutional support, yeah. and they have said they are not going to the CCJ. And this is, well, I know, and that, that's when it, it crashed just at the end of 2015, uh, I want to say 14 or 15, when yeah. it, it, it was in Parliament, but it did well, not... Well, what Mrs. Passard said, not quite through. unfortunately said, is let's go to the CCJ on conditional issues. We'll take criminal and not civil. And not civil, right. But I do remember to that was do issue. that, you would have to have negotiated your treaty that way up front. So she didn't pay attention to the fact that when you entered into the CCJ structures, you needed to say, I'm taking qualified routes. Which goes back to my question about why not have referenda? Why not have the ability to put the, put the um, issues to the people, let them vote on the issue, whether or not, again, if, you, if the people want the mandatory uh, death penalty, if the people want the CCJ, because we have a situation where we all live in echo chambers. So you live with your attorneys and, and you think, yes, this is how it should be because it's how the journalists think a certain way, but the people think a completely different way. Why not put, the, put these questions to the people, so have I, them I, vote I, on? I fortunately am um, the last elected attorney general um, was Ramesh Lawrence Maraj and before that Keith Sobian and I am one. So uh, my echo chamber is San Fernando West and very much the people. And the people that I represent have some very strong issues around this, right? So my echo chamber is certainly not the lawyers. But the issue is the but, people but who I, have strong opinions are the ones who, your, your, who come your, out and your speak. Your point is on referendum. Yeah. I am personally not a fan of referendum. I'm personally, I think it dangerous. I think it can be skewed. And I think that what is required is careful analysis. And then you take it to the committee of the whole of the parliament. Starting a discussion like mm -hmm. we're doing here now is important. Uh, you can poll and understand the, 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 the feeling of what justice looks like and then take it there. The alternative is, is you get the, the accusations that are hurtled, as you all know, that this is a dictatorship, you're all doing what you want, you're not listening to the will of the people. Well, certainly not. Look, look, look at the will, of the, the will of the people say, don't give people bail. The opposition is saying, give them bail. The will of the people is saying, let's have a sex offenders registry for charges. But the, the will of the people is, is, in fact, the opposite. What we are pushing, witness protection, whistleblowing, 
sexual offenses registers. That is on the side of the so-called will of the people because the vast majority of people are asking for these things. But that's based on maybe hearsay, a, a poll here, TV6 people meter. You know, like if you, if you had a system where you could, and let's be real, that's not, that's not science. If, if you went to a vote and you said, listen, oh, 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 at well. least 50% of the population has to vote, and if 50% out of that, the majority rules, then we move move there. I, I, don't, I didn't expect it to I, get into a referendum I, conversation, I, but I, I feel I, like I, there has to be a more scientific way. So, so, so there are scientific ways. I think that before we even get to that point on referendum, a lot of it requires you to see whether the system works or not. You need to put it to work. You have to operationalize. All right, Mr. Agee. So uh, I would be the worst journalist in the world if I did not. Um, you allow me to veer off just yeah, slightly. Yeah, the, the point of open mic <laughs> is open mic, right? right. Your, your, your uh, legal fees came up in the... In the papers, uh, no, today, it did, it, it, no, sorry, it, they come it, up in the papers. It, it was made in papers. Parliament on on Friday, and it was I, I am fully the, released. I'm the on first Attorney General Saturday. that I know of who went to the Parliament to give a value for money um, expose on the but, comparative legal fees, which is, I mean, which is fair. But to the average person looking fair? at it, and I'm let me ask seeing you a question. who before it, did that. Well, I, who who went to, to tell be, you? To be fair, who, if I did not have, who went to tell you? what you purchased for it. Who went to tell you about the billions of dollars that you gained for the expenditure? But there are people who are still saying that it's still a lot of money. You know, it, it, yeah, yeah, it's less than your opposition, but it's still a lot. It's not and less than your opposition. It's half. Sorry, less, not even your opposition. Less than the former administration, it's, it's, I should say. Yeah, that. it's $2.65 billion cheaper. Let me repeat than, that. Two. Point six five billion dollars cheaper for the whole administration costs, but and it's nearly half of what was spent by the previous administration. Let's talk procurement legislation. A big part of the procurement legislation was that uh, the, the new amendments took out legal fees and 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 that sort of oversight. Question: Would Why? That, no, no, no. The because over, at, at the, the, uh, the argument that was given at the time was that okay. it would take too long to no, go no, to, no, to no, three no, people. No, 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 not not at all. Let me explain that. First of all, the oversight that has happened is the Auditor General. This ministry, under my hand, has been audited by the Auditor General up to April of this year, right. with no issues. The reason that the legal fees and other arrangements were taken out, number one, it lines up with the CARICOM model. Number two, it lines up with the European model. Number three, the manner in which it was designed is such that you would have to go and get three quotes. Right, and, and, that's, and get, that's the speed on, that it was... No, not the speed. Like. You'd get three quotes from anybody. And if you had somebody who put in a quote, say, advertise, I want to sue Kijan Haynes, or I want mm -hmm. to investigate X um, sig significant matter, you put that in the papers, a lawyer who has an interest in representing that man says, okay, I will go and apply for that. And then, when I don't get it, I have challenge proceedings, and I'll take four years challenging it in court. That's why, that's why the European Union, that's why the CARICOM model, that's why Jamaica, that's why none of them have it. So what is, so what is the alternative to transparency? Because the average person does not know what is a good legal fee, what's a good I'll give you an example. Money, and what is a way of saying, is there a way that we can say, I'll... Uh, if someone let, let, audits and says, yes, this is this let me is ask you something. for money, rather than you saying, it, this is valuable Well, not me say. The Auditor General inspects the books here. Right. It is not Faris al Rawi or the, any attorney but general. But you saying, oh, this is value. No, no, no. Is the point is the Auditor General is here. I can give examples of value. And in the examples that I gave, I said, the Board of Inland Revenue asked for certain attorneys. They nominated. The bill was $18 million in 41 matters. And the sum of money was $10 billion, right? Those are examples of what you're treating with. I know for a fact in the OAS matter where we, reg where we regained $1 billion mm -hmm. for the state that there were legal fees expended. The, this will always but, be a bacchanal. Right, and, but the thing is, you don't make laws for you. You make laws for the government yeah. that comes after. So why not have a situation, uh, have, a, have a law that will create uh, non none of the doubt? That we this man get eight million dollars. Well, we, eight we, million dollars could be well. Hold on, we, fair we do have versus, the law. We have the law. Is there a cap on how much a lawyer can make well, or how many cases, how many briefs they can get? Let, let, let me like, ask you this. Let me ask you this. 
we, we, we have to talk in specifics. What you have to do is to go, the reason why this ministry was able to spend $380 million odd in five years, as opposed to $630 million by the last administration, is because we use the lawyers in-house. We only use senior counsel right. or experienced attorneys to your, lead that those was your teams. Campaign promise, so it, it right? Worked. Yeah, but, but now, now I get to show you the facts. Again, but, and we were going dangerous, we don't want time, but what I was saying is, again, this is good if you think that this is good, but the law Listen, is not for you, but maybe the, yeah, the, no, uh, the, but Kishan, attorney, the um, my, governments that come my, down my, the line. My job is to do the transparency approach that I did. My job is to give you the value for money to present the books of Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. to the Auditor General. Look, for instance... So, so, there's, so are you saying there's no better way than that the, this is the best way that this can be done right now? Well, why does CARICOM do it that way? Why do all of the other jurisdictions in Europe do it that way? Well, they don't have the problems yeah. we have, you know. But what I can, have what I, what I can tell you, look at the CLECO matter. Look at other matters that are very large-scale. Large-scale matters are complicated, and therefore you're going to see aspects. My job is to provide information. My job is to give transparency. My job in giving transparency on murder is to spark a conversation. Are we ready to have this point? What are the pros and cons? My job to say I want to criminalize revenge pornography is to provide protection. My job in saying ban child marriage or my job in creating courts, I have an obligation for a time being to hold on to a wheel to give my end of the equation on behalf of the prime minister who asked me to do this. So. These are the best ways that we can. What we want to do is to open this mic and to have and people have like you thing. ask the hard questions, unfiltered, throw the questions, get the answers, and come back for more. So that's well, what we want to do. And that, and that is a great way to, to end because we are about two minutes left on time. So uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, let's just do a, another quick recap if you, if you tuned in late. So we were talking uh, death penalty. Uh, we explained Pratt and Morgan because a lot of people are asking, well, why haven't we hang, hanged anybody since Dole Chady? Uh, Pratt and Morgan, if you, don't, if you don't go through all of your appeals within five years, years of the first conviction, you're not going to be hanged. Uh, they, we are looking, hopefully, somewhere in the future, the possibility of uh, categorization of murder that has not gone before the cabinet just yet, but it will. And in September, we are looking at uh, a Privy major Council. landmark case in the Privy Council, which could see the mandatory death penalty being, could see, could see, being struck down. So that is it for me on this side. But since this is actually the Attorney General show, he gets to take you out. So good night for me. So I get, I get to do the wrap up and I get to say, Kijan Haynes, thanks for always being you, asking the hard questions, boldly, intelligently. The Office of the Attorney General is immensely grateful to you. Permit me to big, big up and give a huge shout out to Farzana Nazir Mohammed, who's our head of our criminal division, yes. to Valine Guerra, to Farah Abdul, to Delicia Blackman, to Rhea Bereton, to Jason Das, to Ashley Singh, to Nilini Ramjit. These are our hard-working team members. The Office of the Attorney General has some of the best and brightest people, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to that particular team. I haven't even touched my anti-terrorism team or my civil justice team, etc. I want to say to Trinidad and Tobago, it's events like this that allow us the opportunity to spread the issue discussion. I'd like you to tune into more. Feel free to throw out your views. We have uh, Facebook, we have Instagram, we have YouTube, we have podcast platforms. Uh, we want to be here week after week and to have um, open mic conversations. One day we'll invite you, Kijan, and say, well, we'll just do whatever you want to do. So you might get right. an open mic shot to ask me some more hard questions. So Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the world, thank you for tuning in. Uh, join us at our next podcast, our next platform on all of our, our, our platforms, Twitter, Instagram, etc., Facebook. And thank you so much. Have a great night.